the way of announcements, uh, we're still practicing our, our COVID consciousness in the sense of uh, what we're doing here at church. And so uh, I remind you that our offering plate is up here. We won't be passing it. The communion cups are out there. We're using the packet still. And uh, so uh, when we have our communion, uh, if you haven't picked up a packet, you can go out during the communion song and pick one up and go back in. And also, in the way of announcements, uh, I wanted to announce our 4th of July celebration. Yeah, actually, it says it, says it on, we have two posters here, and, and, it, and it says on it, you know, come bring your family and join us for a 4th of July celebration, Saturday, August 7th. <laughs> And we're doing it at 1 p.m. at the Petersons, and that's 451 uh, Diana Drive in Hydesville. And uh, I just, uh, the things that are going to be provided that are going to be on the menu there, uh, hot dogs, a hot dog spread, you know, all the trimmings that go with it, uh, potato salad and coleslaw, beverages, place settings, and a barbecue if you wish to cook your own food, in other words, if you want something other than hot dogs. And so then it comes under what to bring, an outdoor chair, if you have one, and if you choose a potluck dish, that's optional. We're going to have plenty to eat, but if you have something you want to come and share with people and bring it, feel free to do so. Uh, your own food, if you want something different than hot dogs. And uh, most importantly, bring yourself and friends and family, even if you didn't sign up, you're all, we're all invited. So uh, just, uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. I know that that was so much fun, and we, while we couldn't do it on the 4th of July, we can still have a great time together on August 7th. So uh, keep that on your calendar and your plans. And uh, also, uh, the, in reference to, to the offering, uh, since we're still doing on our, our uh, live stream online, um, let it be known that we, uh, you can do your offering through the mail as well. And people are concerned about you know, our, our mailbox. You know, would somebody come and possibly take it? We have a locked mailbox. Uh, so feel free to do that if, if that uh, works better for you. Um, in the way of prayer that we, I would like to share with you, uh, I, I got a message just this morning, just a little bit ago, from uh, Ricky and uh, Paul Clark, and uh, her surgery, eye surgery, went ex- perfect, and there's going to be no restrictions of any kind. She can drive again already, and, and uh, the doctor is extremely pleased with her follow-up and, 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 and everything, so uh, they wanted to make sure that we knew that, and again, uh, thanking us for our, our prayers and support. And uh, then we want to continue to pray for uh, what's going on in the way of COVID uh, in our nation and in our county. Our county seems to like to spike here periodically. And so uh, we just need to pray again that, that uh, uh, God would intervene and bring an end and, we, and, and continue to pray that and then pray for recovery for those who have uh, cont- contracted it and protection for those who haven't. So uh, let's uh, pray together this morning. <laughs> yes. Yep. Amen. Okay. Yeah, Kathy mentioned that I have a dentist appointment tomorrow. 80 minutes in the seat. So uh, my uh, scaffolding accident is finally ca- doing the rest of its work. <laughs> so I uh, just appreciate that. And uh, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning with a, first off, with a confidence. We, you have invited us to approach your throne with a confidence and an assurance uh, for your mercy and your grace. And it is an awesome thing to contemplate. The God of all creation, the God of our salvation, 
is concerned about everything in reference to our needs. And so we come to you with confidence and, 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 and bring our needs before you. We also bring our thanksgiving. Uh, we think of, of uh, Ricky uh, Clark and, and the successful surgery for laser surgery on her eyes. Uh, just uh, the doctor calling it a number one success uh, and uh, no restrictions. And so we just thank you for that. I know that the, that has just an, been a real blessing for them. And uh, we give you the glory, Lord. And for Lee, the, we just thank you for her quick recovery and her ability to be able to be up and around. And again, we give you the glory. And Father, for the procedures coming up, uh, which includes me, I just bring them to you and ask, Lord, that your hand would be involved and things would go uh, according to schedule and plan. And uh, quick recovery there. And then finally, Lord, we come... And, and bring this uh, continuing prayer request before you, Lord, in reference to the COVID uh, virus that is, uh, just seems to be going up and down and, and, and up again. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would be with those that uh, we know, maybe loved ones or friends that have uh, contracted the COVID, and we ask that you would bring them to full and quick recovery. And those, Lord, that have... Uh, that we've been able to uh, stay away from it, that you would continue to protect us. And we just ask, Lord, that you would be with uh, the service again as we open your word, open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to be in the book of Esther. And uh, I will be reading a few verses here and there out of the book uh, of Esther, but uh, uh, I wanted to uh, start with a reminder, and I think it's important to, to see this, a reminder of, of God's covenant with his people that he had made, especially pointing it out that goes back to the, the promises and the covenant that he made with Abraham in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 12, when, when God called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees into the promised land, he says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. That would be the, the Hebrew people. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. And then he goes on and, and says uh, that he will bless him and, and uh, bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed through him. All the families of the earth shall be blessed through him. So that includes the, the, all the people that have come, you know, that have ever been, basically. And uh, the a covenant that he made with Abraham, when Abraham was 99 years old, this is in chapter 17 of Genesis, uh, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. A multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which uh, was exalted father was the meaning for that, but your name shall be called uh, Abraham, and that means father of the multitude. And uh, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you... Uh, uh, into nations and kings uh, that will come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, God, uh, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So you can see this... this amazing promise. And all through 
the Old Testament, we see God having to, to, as Israel falls away from God, having to bring judgment on them and then restoring them again and, and keeping faithful to this promise to Abraham. And, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's extremely interesting that we, you know, the book of Esther demonstrates this commitment and promise of God. And yet it never mentions God by name. But after you read through it, you see God's hand moving all through it, and you realize this is, this is God's you know, word. It belongs here in his word. There's been debates over the centuries of whether it should be here or not because it doesn't mention God. But it, as you go through it, it's very clear God is at the center of all that's going on here. Uh, so I, I put it down for me. I said, you know, I, I, I see... Uh, this is a record of, of God's intervention and, 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 and keeping of that promise. And, and again, I, I still hear uh, occasionally people will say, well, is, are those promises for us? And I, so let me read to you from Galatians chapter 3. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ... You have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so we are part of this promise. So this is important to us. And as we go through Esther, it applies to us, as we can see in the sense of, of looking what God has done here. Uh, so, uh, an amazing, I, I, again, I put it as an amazing record of God's sovereignty and providence and faithfulness to his people, to his chosen people. And, and so, I want to present to you the book of Esther this morning, <laughs> I guess in a nutshell, so to speak, uh, because I, we, we're going to go through the whole thing very quickly, but I think you'll catch the drift of what I felt was really important here. In chapter 1, uh, King Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus is the way that is pronounced, also known as Xerxes, uh, uh, King Ahasuerus uh, gives a seven-day feast for all his officials and all his servants. And so he wants his wife, on the seventh day, he wants his wife to come to the feast. Now, his reason is pride. She's a beautiful woman, and he basically wants to show him off and say, look at my beautiful wife, Ashiti, uh, Ashti, excuse me, Ashti. And, and so he asks her to come to the feast. In fact, it says he commands her to come to the feast, and he wants to show off her beauty, but she refuses. King's really upset. In fact, it says he's very angry. And the end result of this is that Vashti is demoted, in, or so to speak, and you might say she's fired, <laughs> and she's no longer the queen. She's put a, a, aside. So we get to chapter 2, and we end up with a uh, need to find a new queen. Now, I'm going to put it in my way of looking at it because they were looking for the most beautiful girl, so I said they put on a beauty pageant for queen. And, uh, and uh, there was a man by the name of Mordecai, and uh, he had a, a much younger cousin named Esther. And he was, because her parents had died, he was the he had taken the, the responsibility of caring for her. In a sense, you would say he was her personal redeemer and taking care of her and, 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 and making sure that everything was fine. And he encouraged her to enter into this, to be a part of this. And, and, and so she's there. And it says in chapter 2, verse 17, uh, The king 
as, as it goes through it, it says, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the, the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther becomes the queen of the empire. And Mordecai warns her, gives her a caution. Whatever you do, don't, <laughs> don't lay hold of your heritage. Don't let him know that you are a Jew. And just keep that to yourself. And so she is quiet about that. And so shortly after all of this takes place, Mordecai, who was apparently some, an influential person within the community, He's sitting at the gate, and he overhears some men speaking. And he overhears it. It's a plot to uh, lay, it said, lay hands on the king. The idea of lay hands would imply that they were going to assassinate him. Okay, at, at least to pull him down and replace him. And so the idea of laying hands on the king. And, and so Mordecai tells Esther, Esther tells the king, and the plot fails, and the, the, these men are hung. Okay, that was the form of execution in, in the kingdom at that time. And so, just and, and that's a side note. I mean, it, it's like it doesn't have anything to do with everything else, but we see that it does, and has a tremendous amount to do with it as we get into the story. In chapter 3, we have a man by the name of Haman appear into the picture. And if I were saying this in a Jewish community, there would have been hisses and boos and, and stomping of feet because that's every, when the story of Haman, this is, Esther is read, Haman is a despicable character, as you'll see, and, and, and it's, uh, it's, they, there's a, a whole thing about uh, the things that they do when the story is read to them, when the scriptures are read to them. But he was, uh, he was the, uh, it says he was Haman the Agagite, and he was appointed as the number two person next to the king. And therefore, a man of great influence, he would be a person that the people would bow down to as he came by. He, 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 was, he was the representative, representative of the king, basically. So wherever he went, he was treated as if he was the king uh, because he was representing the king uh, in, in a very powerful way. And so uh, I want to give you a little side note, though. I was thinking, well, what difference does it make if he's an Agagite? Yeah. Well, it turns out the Agagites are part of the Amalekites, their king was Agag, okay, and they were they are ancient enemies of the Hebrew people. And when you go back and say maybe uh, Numbers chapter twenty four or First Samuel chapter fifteen, you'll read and, and see that the Agagites were were executed, and 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 and. and and the king Agagai had been spared initially, and he was executed. And so there's this hatred within the Malachites, and especially the family of the Agagites, <laughs> uh, uh, towards the Jewish people. So Haman now, you can start to see how this is coming together. Haman's elevated to number two person, and he hates the Jews. He doesn't know that his queen is Jew. And, and, and so this is, you can see this thing brewing. This is, this is like an intense you know, movie on the, uh, or something. You know, it's building in its, its plot. You know? um, but when, it came to, when he came to the gate, when Haman came to the gate, everybody bowed down but one person. You can guess who that was. Mordecai. And, and 
for any of you who have taught Sunday school or maybe been in church uh, all your life and have had Sunday school, Esther's a story that's, that's told in Sunday school vernacular, but I'll tell you what, it's not a Sunday school story if you really get down to it. It's, it's a, a very intense uh, and sometimes graphic story. And uh, so may, he doesn't bow down. Mordecai doesn't bow down. So Haman goes after Mordecai and realizes he's a Jew. He makes the connection, but he, he, doesn't, do it, he doesn't say anything about it in reference to Esther. Uh, and uh, he's, he's after all of the Jews because of what Mordecai did. And when I say all of the Jews, I mean an all of the Jewish people in the Babylonian kingdom. In 127 different provinces. He wants the Jews done in. He wants basically a genocide. Now, it's an interesting thing that he does. It shows his superstition. He says, but when would be a good time to do this? I, I want to have, and it doesn't say this in the story, but it implies because of what he does. He wants to have the favor of the gods. And so he casts lots. Well, in the Babylonian kingdom, that's called casting purr. Purim is where the day of Purim comes from. Casting lots. That's what he did. He casted lots and decided, and, and, and it was going to be quite a lengthy period of time, the, the, the day they settled upon, uh, away. Okay? But in that period of time, uh, he was able to approach the king and uh, get his favor on this. And, and, and he presented the Jews as, as ones who would be um, rebellious and not, not faithful. And uh, he uh, sets a date. He, like I said, he sets the date through casting lots. And it's an edict set by the king throughout the whole kingdom, all 127 provinces. So we're talking clear over to Egypt, out to the, to the, you know, out into what is almost part of modern day India today. And I mean that extensive kingdom. All the Jews were going to be wiped out. And there, and and people who were their enemies, if you will, in any of those areas, were going to be allowed to come up against them. And not only would they be able to kill them, but they would be able to plunder them as well. Um, the Jews hear the edict. They've got a little bit of time, but there's nowhere they can go. The, the kingdom's bigger than, than, they, than, than they can move or travel in that period of time. They see, in a sense, they're the, what's the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and they're across the kingdom in mourning uh, over what is coming about. And I, I look at this, and I think, other times where Satan has come against God's plans, this is an evil thing, so it's Satan behind it all in the ultimate picture. And I'm thinking, yeah, the book of Exodus, the killing of the, of, 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 of the, the male children, throwing them into the river was an equally ugly, terrible thing. Or how about when Herod had all the children under, uh, under the age of two, all the male children under the age of two in, 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 in and around Jerusalem and Bethlehem, murdered? You see, there, there's all these attempts to, to, to thwart God's plan. But Satan will never prevail. Well, Mordecai is looking at the situation and he says, Esther, <laughs> uh, I want you to go to the king 
and present yourself and see how you can work this out, maybe that you can get this to stop. Esther informs him and reminds him, he didn't have to tell him, but he basically reminds him, you don't just show up to the king and, and ask for uh, an audience. If you do show up and ask for an audience, if you don't have his favor, and generally he, he appointed his, uh, showed his favor by pointing his, his uh, scepter, thank you, pointing his scepter towards them and allowing them to approach his, his throne. But if he's not in the mood, you could be executed. And so, you know, Esther's looking at this, you know, uh, be approved or die. You know, and she says, you know, I haven't been invited to be in the king's presence for 30 days. I don't, I, 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 and the implication is that he's not on her list right now. And uh, so we come to verse 14 of chapter 4. And for me, this is the most, uh, it, it's the center of this for me as, as, as I've gone through it. Mordecai says to Esther, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. What is he saying there? He's saying, God's not going to let the Jewish people die because there is a, he's implying this. There's a covenant made with Abraham. God's got a promise out here. He is going to, to do something about this. But, he says to her, uh, you know, uh, but you and your father's house will probably perish. And who, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, he says, could this, can you see that this could be God's plan all along? The reason why you're queen is to be able to, to get his ear and thwart this plan of Haman. And you start to think about where, where you are and what you, at whatever point of life you are in. If we believe in, in God's sovereignty and, 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 and opening the path that we walk over through our lives, God may be looking at this very time to use you in a particular way for a particular person at a, at a particular time. God, this is the way God's kingdom is built. It's through people yielding to this at such a time as this, such a place as this, a testimony, a time, sometimes to speak up even though it's not going to be the most popular thing to do. Well, uh, she's, she goes with it. She goes before the king. He points her scepter. Uh, she talks to him. And what she wants to do is she wants to put on a banquet for Haman and the king as their special guest. Now, we're going to have to jump back now to where I said this side note about Mordecai and, and stuff. Uh, you know, uh, listen to this. It's, it says, and, and I, I'm putting this again in my own words, the night of the king's insomnia. He can't get to sleep. So he asks one of his servants to read his memorable deeds record. Memorable deeds re record. He, he, he doesn't, he, you know, I, I think what he wants to do is he wants to be lulled to sleep by all the good things he's done, you know, the, and, and the th good things that he said, and the memorable deeds, you know, that make him, you know, important. And they come to the part where Mordecai through Esther, had saved the king by revealing the plot for those people to lay hands on him. And it makes no record of any reward. 
to him. And this catches the king's thoughts as he's leading. He's, it's almost like he's waiting to hear the memorable good thing he does for Mordecai, you know. And, and it's empty. And it really gets to him. He says, I've got to do something for Mordecai. So the king asks Haman. In fact, we've got to look at this. Verse, chapter 6, verse, uh, oh, I don't want to read the whole thing. Verse 6. Haman's coming. To, it comes into the king. He's been asked for, and uh, what should be done to? Uh, and he, he gives a story uh, about Mordecai, but doesn't, it doesn't mention him. I don't think in the sense of by name. And he says, "What should be done for to, to the man whom the king delights to honor?" And Haman said to himself, hmm, "Whom would you be? Uh, whom would the king delight to honor more than me?" He's, he's thinking. I'm his right-hand man. I've done good work for him. He's thinking about honoring me. This guy is really caught up with himself. And uh, Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought with the, uh, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and, and, the, and, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, not a servant, but one of his court officials, and let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, this shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The king said to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horses you have said, and do so for Mordecai. Ouch. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. I could read it probably this way. So Haman took the robes. <laughs> yeah. Haman has to lead Mordecai on the horse, all dressed up in royalty, all through the... <laughs> you, you, you have to, to relish this beautiful justice that God has, has, has brought out here. And, and uh, then... At, at the, the feast, it goes in chapter 7, uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, the plot of Haman to, to he wants to do in Mordecai, he's built a, 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 a gallows to hang him on, and it's higher than, than it needs to be, and the implication is, is that the majority of the city would be able to see because of the height of this gallows. And, and so at Esther's banquet, she... Uh, she uh, points out Haman's plot uh, to do in Mordecai and all the Jews, and the king orders Haman now to be hung on the gallows that Haman built to hang Mordecai. The tables have been reversed. Now, the king has a problem here. When, you make, when the king actually makes an edict and puts it in writing, and sends it out to, and puts it in the record book, and then sends it out to the 127 provinces. It can't be undone, so he can't just turn around and say, "the the thing is off about you guys rising up and killing the Jews." But what he does instead is he makes another edict that basically says the Jews can defend themselves, <laughs> and God is with them. And the enemies of the Hebrew people are destroyed. The tables are reversed. The Jews are allowed to defend themselves. Their enemies are destroyed. In chapter 9, verses 20 through 28, it, this is what, what is done in reference to what's now called the Feast of Purim. By the way, the Feast of Purim is still practiced to this day, still celebrated to this day. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of, of King uh, Ahasuerus, uh, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month 
that had been turned for them from sorrow and gladness uh, into gladness, and from mourning into in, into a holiday, that they should make them di- uh, t- that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. It's it becomes a holiday and a celebration for the Hebrew people. And they call it the Purim, which is an interesting, again, catch to the fact that that's how, casting the the lots, the Purim, which was uh, the way the the Babylonians called it, uh, showed that 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 was the day that they were to be executed, turned out to be the day that they could defend themselves. And God honored them and protected them. And so they celebrated it. I looked at this, and, and I want to conclude this with just reading the, the, the whole of chapter 10. All three verses. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him and they are they not and are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of media media and persia for um, mordecai the the jew was second in rank to king Ahasuerus, and he was great among the jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. What an amazing thing. After you read through this, and if you read all the details, in there, you see God's hand. His sovereignty puts it all together in such a way that the Hebrew people are blessed, Haman is cursed, and, and, and the, 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 the whole thing brings about an amazing deliverance to the Hebrew people. And it just to show us over and over and over again, God is there. God is not allowing anything to thwart his plan. Because if this plan had been successful, there would have been no lineage of Christ. You see, God's got, he, he, he knows the beginning from the end and has put it in place so it will come about. By the way, that means his second coming is a, is a firm thing. And uh, when we celebrate communion, we're recognizing what he has done and what he is yet to do and resting with what he is even doing now is recognition. And so he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we are to examine our hearts, to prepare our hearts to receive communion. And, and because we have communion together every Sunday, sometimes it's easy to fall into a routine where, oh, it's time for the communion. I want to suggest to you while we sing our communion song that uh, you take this opportunity to, to be doing exactly what the Scripture ta- calls us to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and, and that's to examine ourselves and, and, and see uh, you know, if there's anything that God needs to, to work on, and, and we can bring it to confession and, and uh, be right before him as we share in communion together. Would the worship team come up, please? love vast as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life a ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount a 
of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Let me all thy love accepting love him ever all my days. Let me seek thy kingdom only and my life be to his praise. He alone shall be my glory. Nothing in this world I seek. He has cleansed and sanctified me. He himself has set me free. He alone shall be my glory. Nothing in this world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. In chapter 11 of the, gospel, of, of the letter uh, that Paul wrote to First Corinthians, the First Corinthians letter, he wrote, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on, in the same way also Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for your love that you poured out on the cross. What an amazing, amazing thing to contemplate, to meditate, and to think about. The God of all creation emptied himself and became flesh, dwelt among us even to the point of the cross. But it doesn't end there. The resurrection shows that not only did he have the authority to cover our sins, but that in his resurrection we see his ability to keep his promises to us as well. And we thank you that we have this to believe in, to rest in, and to, in our assurance of our salvation, Lord. I think of the song that we sang, the first song we sang this morning. Uh, the, the, from the Keith Green song, uh, uh, There is a Redeemer. In the last chorus it says, Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. And so we come to you and we say thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your Word that reveals your, your purpose and, and desire for your, your church. And we ask, Lord, that you would Strengthen us, cause us to walk closer and closer to you. No matter what point in our walk we are with you, we ask that you would strengthen us to walk closer yet. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for being here this morning, and uh, as we close, would you stand please, and we'll have our closing song. Enjoy the rest of the day. The sun is popping out.